Good morning to you and welcome. It's good to see you. It's good to be here and welcome to those joining us online. It's uh, great to have this opportunity to, to be together in worship. Uh, a number of notices uh, to, to bring to you this morning. Um, I did circulate material by email the other day, um, which looks a bit like that, except the one you've got has got pictures. Um, I, if you're on email, I give you pictures because I think you maybe need that. Um, if you want the printed copy without the pictures, there, uh, there are a few copies up at the door. And it's just telling you about a whole variety of things that are happening over the next couple of weeks. And a uh, couple of weeks, next month. And uh, so please uh, take it and please read it and follow up on the things that uh, interest you and pray for the different things that are going on. Anyway, things coming up in the next week or two. Uh, our evening service tonight at half past six, they have started back again. And uh, this evening, the service is conducted by uh, Willie. And Willie is, once a month or so, doing a series on the opening chapters of Revelation. Um, and tonight, he's on the third of the churches, the church at Pergamum. Um, and I would commend the series to you. I know we found it particularly helpful. So if you're able to go along to the, tonight, half past six, across in Trinity. Our prayer time on Zoom tomorrow uh, between 8 and 9. Do join us for that. If you need any information, let us know. And it's a space, as we always say, to pray together, to have spent quiet time together. You don't need to pray out loud. You can simply pray silently and enjoy the silence. Tomorrow evening, 8 till 9 on Zoom. And our Wednesday reflective service, half past 10, here in the building for half an hour or so. It's just good having spaces through the week when we can half time we can do it on our own but doing it with others can actually be very helpful uh wednesday half past 10 and similarly thursday the new well-being at the baptist church between 10 and 12. and then on friday evening uh, the next starlight cafe is happening up in the baptist church hopefully in the garden weather permitting and that's between seven and nine and i think this week the theme is somewhere around marshmallows and so on don't ask me but that's Friday evening, 7 till 9. And then next Sunday uh, in the morning, we're having our harvest uh, service. A little early perhaps, but fair enough. Um, and next Sunday, we have a guest speaker, uh, Reverend Gordon Palmer, who's coming to speak on behalf of Tear Fund and tell us a bit uh, about their work. He's the retired Church of Scotland minister. Um, so the theme will very much be that of Tear Fund and something about the work they are doing. And there will be an opportunity to contribute to a harvest offering if you wish to do so. And obviously that will be going to support the very worthwhile work that Tear Fund do around the world. And next Sunday evening, um, again, yes, there is the evening service, but next Sunday is being taken by Radiate. In other words, Cara's organizing it. Young folk and different folk will be taking part. There'll be stuff about the holiday club, I believe. I think there'll be things about the cafe. And... Uh, I'm sure it will be a good time, but it's always good to have a praise band that comes from the, the various churches. That's next uh, Sunday evening, half past six in Trinity. A wee note uh, on behalf of uh, Anne and Eric, uh, who want to say on behalf of the family, we greatly appreciate all the love and support we've had, especially over the last few weeks. We are so blessed. Well, actually, that's what church life is about being able to support one another in the good times and in the dark times. And of course, this Tuesday, we have uh, Craig Sisters Leslie's funeral is happening, taking place at the Harlot Crematorium. That's at 11 o'clock on Tuesday morning. Um, I think you're encouraged to wear brighter clothes. Is that a fair way of putting it, Craig? Um, so you don't need to dig out the black, okay? And if you need help with transport to get there, or if you can offer help with transport, please speak to Leslie here, and we can get that sorted out. And just a couple of other things to mention. Sorry, there's quite a few things today. But the prayer breakfast, the monthly prayer breakfast, are starting up again. And the first of this year's uh, is on Saturday, the 7th of September. It's across in Trinity from half past eight till nine. As you probably know, 8.30 till 9 is, did I say 8.30 to 9? 8.30 to 9 is breakfast. 9 till 10 is praying together in small groups. This time it's in Trinity, 
And again, it's good to gather with folk from across the, the three churches and other churches sometimes to, to be praying together for matters local, national, international. So that's a week on Saturday, the 7th of September. And also that morning, from half 10 till 12, the next of the Brunch at the Bothy events will be taking place here. And as we said before, we do encourage folk to invite others to come along because it would be great to be able just to have space there and time there to, to get to know others, to have conversations with them. And yes, our desire is to speak about Jesus with them through what is happening. So that's happening, as I say, a week on Saturday. I think that's all the things I need to say. There's plenty to go on with, so look at the sheet because that'll keep you up to date. Praise the Lord. Praise God in his sanctuary. Praise him in his mighty heavens. Praise him for his acts of power. Praise him for his surpassing greatness. We are here to worship a great God. And let's do that as we sing together, holy, holy, holy. God in prayer let's pray our Heavenly Father we come before you this morning as your children humbly with love in our hearts and adoration on our lips you are such a holy God who lives in unapproachable light you are above all things you created all things 
Everything it is, is in place at your command. And yet, you love each one of us just as we are, with all our faults and feelings. And you invite us into your presence. You say that you delight in our praises. You listen to our requests and you speak to us. We deserve nothing and you have given us everything in Jesus. Thank you that we can know you in our lives. Help us to know you more. Give us teachable spirits that each day we would learn more of you. Help us to see you more clearly, to love you more dearly, and to follow you more nearly, day by day. Open our ears and our hearts to your word today. Help us to truly hear what you are saying to us. Help us to take it to heart, to meditate on it, to be changed and transformed as we apply it to our lives. Heavenly Father, we yield our lives to you again this morning. You are the master potter. Keep on molding us into what you want us to be and fill us with your Holy Spirit. Forgive us all our wrongdoings, all our wrong attitudes. Make these plain to us by the work of your spirit in our lives and melt our hearts so that we could be changed and renewed. As your word is preached today in this place, in this community, in our city, our nation, our world, may you speak to your people, challenge and inspire us, encourage us, rebuke us we pray for our own church family here today for this family of faith that you've put us in we pray a blessing on each one whether in this place on zoom or at home those who have drifted away bless we pray restore renew and equip each one of us for what you have in store for us to do for you. And now we pray slowly and meditatively the prayer that you taught your disciples, saying, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation. For yours is the power, glory forever. Amen. Thank you, Leslie. We want to just to take a little time this morning to reflect a little on the event that we had at uh, Lendrick Muir last Saturday, a week ago yesterday, the UF Church, the, the Gathering 2024 with the theme, um, We Believe in God, How the Father, Son and Holy Spirit Shape Our Lives and Church Communities. And these annual events are, are always really good places to be. I think we all appreciate them. Uh, this time was a, a new venue or a relative, well, we haven't been here for a long time, at Lendrick Muir, the SU Centre up near Kinross. It's a lovely setting out there in the country, weather wasn't wonderful for it. Uh, being in a new centre always takes a little time for folk to find their way about and all the rest of it. But it was good to be there. It was good to worship together. The praise, the worship, the praise band always inspire us and encourage us in that. It's good to meet folk from different places. There were about 200 folk there. And the, the keynote speaker was uh, the Reverend Dr. Sinclair Ferguson, who's been preaching for a long time. He's a, a theologian, preacher, pastor, and it was good to have him. The, the, I think in the program they'd allocated him uh, 20 minutes, um, 45 or 50 minutes after he started. Uh, and, and he's one of these people, actually, to give him 20 minutes is crazy, because he can talk and you could listen to him for, for hours, I think, quite honestly. 
Uh, and, and it was great to be there. Um, I thought, before I ask one or two other folk to speak about workshops, let me just pick up a few things he said. Now, I wouldn't dare to try and give you a summary of what he said. These were just a few things that I had noted down that I found helpful and you might find helpful too. Uh, he was obviously speaking on this theme. And he said, we believe in God in a society that doesn't. To live out the Christian faith is against the religious orthodoxy of the age. Reminding us, yes, that's what we are. He quoted someone who had said that this is a time particularly challenging and of greatest stress for the Christian faith because it's not the popular thing to be and to do. Yes, it's a challenging time for the Christian faith. It's a challenging time for the church, and we don't need to look far to see evidence of that. But speaking about our society, he said, when you lose God, you inevitably lose any sense that we are made in the image of God, so you lose all sense of personal identity. People do not know who they are. And actually, when you look at our society, I think you see plenty of evidence of that today. He spoke about the colossal fragmentation of human life today. He said, we have lived through a time when the church has not demonstrated the power and glory of God, and he was looking back 20, 30, 40, 50 years or so, a time when the church has not demonstrated the power and glory of God. We've been too horizontal and not vertical enough. We focused on the horizontal and forgotten about God. He said, it was only when Jesus came into this world that people could understand who they really are. And it's only when people find Jesus and get to know Jesus, they discover who they really are. Just a few comments from what he said. He said a lot, and it was great to be there. So three folk are going to come and just share a little bit. Uh, if I could maybe start with Morag and then Craig and then Leslie to finish with. They, each of them were at different workshops, um, and I think I've given them three minutes or something, but anyway, we'll see how that goes. <laughs> yes, I know, an hour and three minutes is hard. Thank you, Lou. Yeah, not well, trying to be quick. So I was at um, a workshop called Jesus and the Questions of the Age, and it was taken by a guy called Gavin Matthews, who works for Solas. And he started off um, talking about how like the most important questions people have have kind of changed over the last 10, 15, 20 years. Like previously, they were all based around, um, like, to, like to do with Christianity and stuff, based around like science and evidence and the Bible and truth. Um, but in some recent surveys, it, come, it kind of came about that the most important questions people have in their lives are to do with like, identity, purpose, value, and agency. So it's like questions like, who am I? What am I for? What am I worth? Can I change anything? And they don't seem directly, like people might not really acknowledge that they are related to God or whatever, but actually Jesus is where we can find the answers to all these questions. And he used John chapter one to show us how we can use the Bible. And he picked out certain verses and stuff that can help us to answer these questions. Um, and he gave some examples of people who had come to faith, like through not finding the answers to these in other places that they'd been kind of putting their efforts into. Um, then we went into groups just to try and to kind of work that through a bit, think about questions and how we could relate that in life we didn't actually get much time to that didn't get into uh, very much depth um but i did find the workshop quite useful kind of thinking about what we're doing at brunch at the bothy and thinking about how we can like maybe work our themes around maybe some of these sort of ideas about um identity and purpose value and agency and it also just occurred to me as well while i was just preparing for this that he used John chapter one, which is also um, where word to one to one starts. And thought, I don't think that's any coincidence. Okay, so I was at a workshop uh, given by Mark Sterling called The Servant King. Um, and what he was talking about was, in a way, the power in the church. How does 
people of the church use power? Is it for good or is it for bad? Um, because God gave us this power and hopes that we will actually use it in a way that will encourage people, not put them down. Um, we have to bring people on through this encouragement, this power that has been given as a gift. And you gave the quote, the power, we have been given this power to feed God's sheep, not to feed off God's sheep. So as I, again, it was a case of how you could easily misuse power. Um, he then went on to talk about the fourth commandment, which of course you all remember. Uh, about taking God's name in vain. And now a lot of the time, we only think about this as swearing, you know, swearing, taking God's name, and blasphemy. But he said also, it's about how we're living as Christians. If we are calling ourselves Christians and not acting as uh, the way of Christ, we are taking God's name in vain. So it comes down to this, it's also not just swearing, it's our behavior. And if we call ourselves Christians, act like Christians. Um, so he also said, we can't do Jesus' work in a non-Jesus way. And this comes down to being imitators of Christ. So Jesus came as the living image of, of God. And he gave us an example on how to live our life, to be imitators of Christ. And that is uh, coming back also to Philippians 2, 5, which was his main text. And we have to, we don't have to imitate Christ to become Christians, but it's our imitation to show that we are following Jesus, which is the key. Um, and then, yeah, I think that was um, all that, that way. So, Again, Jesus is the image of God. We should aim to be in the image of Jesus, therefore reflecting our Christian beliefs in our work. Mine was um, who we are in Christ when it comes to sexuality and gender identity. This is an area is such a hot topic. You know, there's government legislation coming up and also, and I don't really understand very much about it. So I thought I'd better go and find out a bit more. So I was thinking it would be like talking about things, but actually it wasn't. It was two men talk, telling their stories and it was t very emotional, very humbling and very inspiring. Now I've not got a chance to tell you, but both have two of them. I've chosen one of them, a lovely guy. And he um, said that ever since he was born, or for, for ever since he was thinking as a wee boy, he wanted to be a girl. He just always wanted to be a girl. He thought life would be so much better if he was a girl. He wanted to dress up like a girl. Anyway, he suppressed all this, was miserable. He got married, he had children, but then he thought, no, I'm absolutely miserable. I am meant to be female. I'm going to leave my wife and family and I'm going to, tra what do you call it? Tran transition. So he went through all the, um, the, treatment and surgery and all the rest of it, it came out as a woman then entered a relationship with a man and thought that's it I've arrived this is exactly what I wanted and he said he thought that that would make him happy and fulfilled and complete and it didn't and in fact what happened was that the family of the other man when they found out he was actually a transgender woman shunned him completely broke up the relationship um, he had been a lawyer, he ended up with mental health issues, he couldn't work, he lost his home, he was on the street. He ended up in a, a night shelter run by, you've guessed, a church. And the rule was, if you went to the night shelter, you had to go to the, the, the church, you had to go to the services. So he found himself in this church. But the thing was, the people in the church just loved him and accepted him for who he was, a transgender woman. Um, they, never, they never judged him, um, but they didn't water down what the Bible said either. So he would study the Bible. Um, he had prayer ministry, which I'll come back to later. People prayed with him. And he came to the point where he realized, first of all, it wasn't that his body needed to align with his head. It was his head that needed to align with his body. And this is where we come back to our identity. Um, he'd been created male. God made him in his image, made him male. And what needed to get sorted out was his head, not his body. That was the first thing. 
Um, and he, he, he was terribly sorry for all that he'd done to himself. And in doing so, had blasphemed God, really, because he was saying to God, no, no, you've made me male, but I'm, I should be female. But also for his family, he felt terrible for all that he'd done to them. Don't worry, there's a happy ending coming up. Um, the second thing was that he became a Christian and he was baptised as a transgender woman. That really made me think, I, I struggled, I, I'm still thinking that through, but he, he was baptised as a transgender woman. But he then went through the treatment and he transitioned back to being male. Now, in the workshop was his wife. They were reconciled and they remarried. And you could see how happy they were together. Sadly, his children are still not reconciled to him. He has given up the law. He works for LL Ministries, who have a, a place up north. We've got a friend who's, who's involved there too. It's a place where people go for this prayer ministry. It's more than just praying for or with somebody. I, I need to explore more about it. But for people who are very damaged and need to really hear and get healing from God, um, this is a very powerful ministry for people. So he, that is his now, his life's work, because he wants to help other people. Not necessarily, well, it might be folk with the same troubles as him, it might be other things. Um, yeah, anyway, so, so that's that. Um, now, he, the other chap who'd spoken, I'm not going into that, he was same sex attracted. And he, but both of them spoke about the fact that they got involved with churches where people did not water down what God's word said. They didn't say, okay, it's all right, that doesn't matter, God loves you as you are. God does love you as you are, but he doesn't want you to stay as you are if that's in denial of, of God's teaching both of them said it was the fact that they were taught the truth but it was with love and grace and I think more and more that's what I'm learning in the church that I, I like to think we're an accepting church of, of people who come to us I, I do believe that but there's a, there's a, the two temptations one is to pretend that, that whatever it is doesn't matter and when I say that I mean sexual sin is so easy to see we're all sinners we've, we've no right to judge anybody else and other sins are no worse um, but we can't pretend there's not a problem. Um, I mean, think of Jesus, you know, when the woman came caught in adultery, he didn't say, oh, it's okay. He said, go and sin no more. He was quite clear she was wrong, but he did say to the others listening, you know, whoever's without sin cast the first stone. So, anyway, so the, the thing is we should never water down the truth of God's word, but neither should be judgmental. It, Jesus always confronted people's sin, but with grace and love. And that's what I think as a church and as individuals that we are called to do. Thank you to all three. I hope you get a sense from all of that that it really was a fascinating day in, in so many ways. And I, I think I really particularly appreciated just the, the range of speakers and the quality of speakers. They're always good, but I thought it was particularly good this year. So if you weren't there, I'm sorry about that, but there will be another one coming along next August and we'll let you know about it when we have more information. But thank you. Things there for us to think about and reflect on. And all of them thinking of Jesus. And let's praise him as we sing together, Jesus, strong and kind.
Not many of us like being told we're, we're getting things wrong, do we? We don't like being told that we need to change. We tend to react badly because we're human. You know, we become attached to certain ways of doing things, certain ways of thinking. So why should we change? And it also depends who's telling us that. I mean, what right does that person have to speak in that way? How dare they suggest I'm wrong and they're right? And that's how it was with the religious leaders in Jesus' time. We've seen that over the last few weeks. And in today's passage, we will find them ganging up because there's various groups involved here. They don't actually get on. They can't stand one another, but they've got a common enemy. And so they're gunning for, for Jesus. We might not find people raising the same questions and issues as they do with Jesus. But we all encounter folk, we've touched on that already, we all encounter folk. Some of them want to make followers of Jesus out to be a threat. We've got that in our society today. We've got folk who want to ridicule us and say, what a nonsense following Jesus, faith, religion, all that kind of stuff. And some people, as we've already said, are also asking genuine questions. They want, they genuinely want to find out more. And in responding to these various challenges, we can learn from the approach that Jesus takes and the attitude that he shows. Elizabeth is going to read now from Luke 20 at verse 20. Thank you. Keeping a close watch on him, they sent spies who pretended to be sincere. They hoped to catch Jesus in something he said so that they might hand him over to the power and authority of the governor. So the spies questioned him, teacher, we know that you speak and teach what is right and that you do not show partiality, but teach the way of God in accordance with the truth. Is it right for us to pay taxes to Caesar or not? He saw through their duplicity and said to them, show me a denarius whose image and inscription are on it. Caesar's, they replied. He said to them, then give back to Caesar what is Caesar's and to God what is God's. They were unable to trap him in what he had said there in public and astonished by his answer, they became silent. Some of the Sadducees who say there is no resurrection came to Jesus with a question. Teacher, they said, Moses wrote for us that if a man's brother dies and leaves a wife but no children, the man must marry the widow and raise up offspring for his brother. Now there were seven brothers. The first one married a woman and died childless. The second and then the third married her and in the same way the seven died leaving no children. Finally, the woman died too. Now then, at the resurrection, whose wife will she be, since the seven were married to her? Jesus replied, the people of this age marry and are given in marriage. The, the, the people of this age marry and are given in marriage, but those who are considered worthy of taking part in the age to come and in the resurrection from the dead will neither marry nor be given in marriage. And they can no longer die, for they are like angels. They are God's children, since they, are, since they are children of the resurrection. But in the account of the burning bush, even Moses showed that the dead rise, for he calls the Lord the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. He is not the God of the dead, but of the living, for to him all are alive. Some of the teachers of the law responded, well said, teacher and no one dared to ask him any more questions. Then Jesus said to them, why is it said that the Messiah is the son of David? David himself declares in the book of Psalms, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. David calls him Lord, then how can, this, then how can he be his son? While all the people were listening, Jesus said to his disciples, beware of the teachers of the law. 
They like to walk around in flowing robes and love to be greeted with respect in the marketplaces and have the most important seats in the synagogues and the places of honour at banquets. They devour widows' houses and for a show make lengthy prayers. These men will be punished most severely. Amen. Thanks, Elizabeth. Plenty there to get our teeth into. Earlier in the chapter, going back over the last couple of weeks or so, earlier in the chapter, we had the, the religious leaders, the, the chief priests, the, the scribes and elders who together formed the, the Sanhedrin, the, the Jewish Supreme uh, Council. We found them challenging Jesus over his authority because he had cleared the money changers from the temple. He had spoken out there about turning his God's house into a, uh, which was meant to be a house of prayer, into a den of thieves and all the rest of it. And they questioned his authority. What right did he have to say that? What right did he have to do that? And as part of Jesus' response, we had the, the parable that, uh, of the tenants in the vineyard, which Willie was helping us to think about last week. But you sense this, it's a building up of the animosity from these Jewish leaders. They are incensed at this man, Jesus. They are determined to get rid of him and nothing they try seems to work. And now they try a more subtle approach by planting people in the crowd whom Luke describes as spies who pretend to be honest. It's not obvious who they are. There's one here and one there and two there and so on, in amongst a whole crowd of, of, of people. And they're there and they think they have got the question that's going to trap Jesus and get rid of him once and for all. And so they pretend to be genuine as they ask this question, which is actually loaded with insincerity. Teacher, we know that you speak and teach what is right. Well, no, they don't think that. And that you do not show partiality. They think he does. But teach the way of God in accordance with the truth. No, they don't believe that or else they'd be following him. None of, nothing in that statement is actually genuine, but they're trying to butter him up as if they think Jesus is stupid and doesn't see through them. And then they get what they think is a killer question. Is it right for us to pay taxes to Caesar or not? And they thought, right, that's it. Well, you see, the Romans had imposed a, a poll tax, it was called, on the Jews which was as popular as the poll tax that some of you may remember from the late 80s in Scotland, should they be paying taxes to Caesar? And if Jesus said they should pay taxes to Caesar, then that would utterly discredit him and ruin his popularity with the ordinary folk. They would want nothing more to do with him if he seemed to be siding with the Roman authorities. But of course, if he said they shouldn't pay anything to the Roman authorities, then those authorities could immediately arrest him as a traitor. So they thought this was a good, a good question. Well, Jesus, of course, is gracious. <coughs> and he begins by asking for a coin. Now, it's probably not the fact he didn't have any coins himself. But he wanted them to show that they were willing to use these coins by giving him one. And they gave him a coin, and that coin would be inscribed as follows. Tiberius Caesar Augustus, son of divine Augustus. That's what was on these coins. That was the coins they were using at that time. Describing Augustus, if you like, as divine, as God. And Jesus said to them, whose inscription is on it? Caesar's, they reply. Then give Caesar what is Caesar's, and give to God what is God's? In other words, he's saying we have a responsibility this, to the secular government. We have a responsibility to God. It's not an either or. We do both. And Jesus, of course, isn't giving detailed teaching here on church and state or good and bad governments or what we do if the government turns against us or anything else. He's simply making the point 
that we have a responsibility to both. And these spies in the crowd must have been pretty disillusioned at this point. They thought this question would do it, and he had got right out of it. Look, in fact, tells us they were amazed at his answer. I wonder, did one or two of them even begin to change? Was Nicodemus there? We, we certainly don't know. It's just interesting that Luke uses the word amazed. But I suspect that most of them were not at all pleased and certainly did not want him to be teaching them about what they were to give to God. How dare he? And yet what we see in Jesus' response here is that he makes a gracious, reasoned, clear response which doesn't miss the mark, touches a bit on what Leslie was saying from her workshop, it doesn't miss the mark. And that's always a helpful approach. It's gracious, it's loving, but it's clear in what is being said. Now, we might not always find it easy to respond to questions in that kind of way. But let's be honest, we can always be gracious. We might not know the answer, but we can always be gracious. That's one lot. And they kind of back off a bit here because they're getting nowhere with their clever question. Up now, we have the Sadducees. Now, the Sadducees disagree with the Pharisees and the Sanhedrin lot. They disagree with them on basically everything. But they come now and they ask a question about resurrection. And it should be said, the Sadducees did not believe in resurrection. They thought resurrection was a load of nonsense. But they decide to ask a question because they think this will trap Jesus. You know, you almost sense these two religious groups competing with one another over who can get the best question. Sometimes people that claim to be following God get it so sadly terribly wrong. And it's tragic when that happens. Now, there is teaching in the Old Testament that if a man died childless, his brother was to marry the widow with a view to continuing the, the family line and so that she was supported. Because that was a society where widows were often left penniless. Nobody bothered about them. Nobody cared for them. So it was there as a compassionate gesture, if you like, so that she would be supported as a widow. By New Testament times, it seems that the practice had almost, or probably maybe totally, disappeared. But it still gives them a question, or the basis for a question, about a woman who ends up marrying seven brothers because the first six all die, and the seventh dies, and the woman dies. And in the resurrection, they say, whose wife will she be? And they're actually, in all of that, trying to ridicule Jesus and all of those who believe in the resurrection, including the other Jewish leaders. And again, Jesus responds graciously. And there's things here that he says that we frankly don't have any other teaching about. So it makes it quite difficult to be sure quite what he is saying, because he speaks about in the age to come and people not being given in marriage and, and all the rest of it. But there's no other teaching elsewhere to help us unpack that and what he means and, and, and what he's saying and, and so on. So there's really not much point in trying to work that one out because we don't have enough information um, to, to, to go on. But I think what it, what it is clear from here and what it is saying is that in the life to come, relationships will be totally different. The whole situation in which we will find ourselves will be so totally different that actually our minds cannot begin to grasp what it is like. He, he's not saying that people won't know one another, but he does seem to be saying that in our relationships in this life are, of course, limited by time. They are affected by this broken, hurting, sinful world. In the life to come, 
it will be so different. I think I've used before the, the illustration of someone saying, trying to explain to us in any detail what the life to come is going to be like is just like trying to explain to a fetus in the mother's womb what life will be like in the big world out there. It is so totally different. The fetus living in this liquid and in the darkness and all the rest of it, in this very confined space. It's so different that actually our minds can't begin to take it in. But we know that the life to come will be perfect. We know that it will be spent in the presence of God. We know there will be such fellowship with others. We know there'll be worship. We know we'll be there serving him. But we don't know much more. But we believe it's wonderful. And we believe it's there forever. And that's, I think, touches a little on what Jesus is saying here. It's not to sidestep the issue. We simply don't know. And sometimes we have to acknowledge we don't know, but we look forward to finding out. And Jesus, in his response, clearly tells them that the resurrection will happen. He tells them it's God's plan. And he reminds them how at the burning bush, God described himself to Moses as the God of Abraham, present tense, the God of Abraham, not the God who was of Abraham who died ages ago, the God of Abraham, present tense, the implication is Abraham is still alive. So the resurrection is true, even if we can't really begin to imagine what it's going to be like, but it'll be wonderful. And at this point, Luke tells us, some of the teachers of the law responded, well said, teacher, and no one dared to ask him, any more questions. As I've said, the particular issues that are being raised here are probably not ones that will be raised with us today. But people still love to ask challenging <coughs> questions, often because they're genuinely seeking to know the answer, although sometimes they're wanting to ridicule or to have an excuse for not believing. And when people do ask us questions, well, first of all, let's be grateful they ask us questions. <laughs> let's be grateful they are that interested. And it's helpful if we can say something in response. But I've suggested we're not Jesus. So we may well struggle. We are not going to be able to respond in the way he did because we're not him. We will be limited. We may well struggle. But we can still respond graciously. And in any response we make, we can be seeking to share something of him through the way we are, through the way we show respect and love, and perhaps by speaking at least a little of what he has come to mean to us. Or maybe to say, I don't fully understand that, but... Or it might be to say, I really don't know the answer, but I'll go and try and find out. I'll speak to others and I'll come back to you. Because people do ask questions. We tend to think that most people today aren't interested. And several times I've heard, recently I've heard folk saying, that is actually not true. It's what we think, but it's not actually true. For instance, evidence from the Bible Society suggests there is a wave of change in terms of the level of interest in Christian things today. And much of that starts online. And much of that, it seems, is happening among young or younger people. And many of them are seeking answers. They're looking, they're searching for something. And that's where it's helpful to have tools that can equip us to better share Jesus with other people. And tools like the word one-to-one, -one, and we're having various training sessions on offer end of this 
end of September into October. You'll hear more about that. But these are little tools that can just help us. And if you've got something in your hand that you can talk about with someone, that makes the whole process easier. But always it's sharing Jesus through our love, through our care, through our compassion, and seeking to speak of him as we are able. And so in this situation that we have in Luke's gospel, his opponents get to the point of realizing it's not worth asking any more questions. This is getting them nowhere. But rather than then them seeing Jesus as someone worth following, most of them now go on to look for other ways to silence him. And we know what's going to happen over the next few weeks. But meanwhile, Jesus goes on to speak and to warn against folk like them. We'll come to that in a moment. But before we do that, let's praise God again. And let's sing together, O Great God, of highest heaven. Jesus now takes the initiative, turning back to the passage towards the end of it, by asking a question of those who are challenging him, which gets right to the heart of their problem, their lack of understanding of who Jesus is, indeed of who the Messiah is, who is to come. And the problem many people still have with Jesus is they have no real awareness of who he is and of how much he loves them, and no sense that he wants us to have a relationship with him for this life and for all eternity. You see, Jewish teaching at that time said correctly that the Messiah would be a descendant of, of David, but they interpreted that to mean that the Messiah would be inferior to David. 
that that the Messiah, if you like, would virtually bow down to David. And Jesus quotes one of David's Psalms to show how wrong, how mistaken that position was, where David describes the one who is to come as Lord. In other words, David is bowing before the Messiah in worship. Because to call Jesus Lord is to have him as Lord of our lives, is to acknowledge his greatness, his power, his wisdom, his authority, so that he comes first in all parts of our lives. And that's challenging. And from this side of the resurrection, if you like, We have much more reason to acknowledge Jesus for who he is because we know how he suffered. We know how he died on a cross, but we know he rose again. And yet, we all struggle at times with acknowledging Jesus for who he is, with allowing Jesus to be Lord of all, of every part of our lives, in every circumstance, choosing his way rather than our own way. It's too much. It's too costly, we often feel. And yet, our lives can speak so powerfully to others of Jesus as they see him living in us. And in the final few verses there, Jesus goes on to give a strong warning against the teachers of the law and others like them. Not just because they refuse to follow him, but because they are causing others to stumble by misleading those that they are supposed to be leading and teaching. And actually what's here is a warning to to all of us and particularly to those who are responsible for leading and, and, and for teaching. And in some of the things Craig was saying from his the workshop he attended, That's what it was speaking about. It can easily be abused. In what we say and do, whatever our position in the church, is there anything which can hinder people in putting their trust in Jesus? I always find that a sobering question. Is there something about me that hinders others in coming to Jesus? These leaders that Jesus is speaking about were puffed up with their own importance. They were obsessed with status and position. Look at me. Look at my wonderful robes. The most influential leader this world has ever had, of course, is Jesus, who willingly laid down his life for us and said, I am among you as one who serves. The servant king, as the the song puts it. These leaders that Jesus condemns took advantage of the weak and the vulnerable. Jesus always had time for everyone, and especially for the weak and the vulnerable, who were and who are so often despised and left at the bottom of the pile, and it still happens in this country today. Whatever position we find ourselves in, Jesus is our model of how we are to be in our dealings with other people. He's a great model. He's a challenging model. Jesus condemns the leaders, but only after he has spent years graciously speaking to them, responding to their claims, trying to get through to them, because he loves them as as he loves all the people. He's gone to such lengths, and he's going to go to even greater lengths, but they have hardened their hearts, and they refuse to listen. And that's the warning for all who stubbornly refuse to respond positively to Jesus, especially when they're causing others to stumble. Jesus still challenges us. The challenge of how we respond to him in the first place. How we respond as his followers over the years. How we respond to him in our everyday lives and whether he's truly Lord. 
and the challenge to be his servants each day, seeking to reach out to others in his name and seeking in all our contacts with other folk to reflect something of Jesus and of his love and of his compassion and of his truth and of his authority, being servants, following the servant king who gave everything for us. Let's just pray for a moment. Lord, your word challenges us. We acknowledge that we find it so hard to have you as Lord of all, of every part of our lives, of everything we are and say and do. And yet help us, Lord, to grow more like you. And Lord, be with us in the contacts we have with others, that when they ask questions of us or raise issues with us, whatever their motivation, help us, Lord, to be gracious as you are gracious, to be loving as you are loving, to be compassionate as you are compassionate, and Lord, to seek to share your truth with them, that by your Spirit, you might work in their lives too. In Jesus' name, amen. We're going to spend a little time now praying for others. Before I lead us in, in prayer, the whole Middle East situation is obviously one that's deeply concerning, and particularly with, with what we've just been hearing about the, this morning with Israel's uh, significant attacks in Lebanon as well as Hezbollah seeking to attack Israel uh, uh, and the fear of how that could escalate. The other day I got this little video, it's from Tear Fund's director in the Middle East and he's just speaking a little bit from last week obviously of their response to the situation in Israel and Lebanon. Let's watch that and then we'll pray for other things. My name is Safa, I'm the regional director for Eurasia and North Africa here at Tear Fund. We're based in Amman, Jordan, and we're surrounded by many uncertainties right now. But one thing is for certain. We're faced with a devastating humanitarian situation in Gaza and the surrounding areas. We're seeing much devastation, we're seeing a lot of heartache, we're seeing a lack of access to water, basic medical needs and food necessities and life necessities. Two of our corporate priorities are crisis to resilience and reconciled and peaceful societies. Our goal is through the work that we do, through uh, partnering with local churches, is to bring this transformation for people to move from a crisis to a resilient state and to be reconciled through peace building effort. Our short term goal is to provide for immediate physical needs, medical needs of people. Our long term uh, strategy is to restore peace into this part of the world. Our partnership together and our prayers together can help do that. Let's pray together for this region. Our Heavenly Father, we come before you right now. Our hearts are grieving for what is uh, being witnessed and what's uh, seen and what's happening in this part of the world. And we pray that although sometimes access is limited, we can't get all the way into the needs, but we know that through your Holy Spirit, your peace and your reconciliation and your comfort and hope can reach uh, the hearts and minds of uh, fathers, mothers and children during this time. We pray that through our effort, we can reach the, the most needs and that we have the biggest impact on our communities. We pray these things in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Lord, we're so conscious of living in a broken, hurting world, a fearful world for many who are suffering so much. And we give you thanks for the work of Tear Fund, and we do pray for Tear Fund and other agencies, workers in the Middle East, in Israel and Lebanon and Gaza, as they seek to share your love there. We pray for your protection. We pray for your wisdom. We pray for your equipping. And we do pray that events overnight will not lead to an even worse escalation of that whole situation. We pray for your restraining hand. We pray for wisdom for leaders around the world as they respond to what is happening. Lord, we dare to pray for peace to come 
to that terribly troubled region. But we pray too for all affected by the Russian-Ukraine conflict. We pray, Father, for that situation where again tension and fighting has escalated in recent weeks. And we remember those there who are mourning the loss of loved ones. We pray for their comfort. We pray for their peace. And we do pray, Father, that you will bless your people serving in Ukraine for your church there as they seek to offer love and compassion to those who need it so much. And Lord, again, we pray for an end to that conflict and for wisdom for the international community and how they respond. And Lord, we know that other areas too, we're asked to pray for West Africa, especially countries such as Nigeria, experiencing terrible conflict and unrest in places. And again, we pray for peace and we pray for those who are suffering. And we pray for safety for humanitarian workers there, conscious that a number have been killed in recent months. We pray, Father, for peace in that region too. And we thank you for your church around the world. We thank you for your people who are involved in so many challenging places. But Father, we think too of our own community and our own city, conscious that in this area too, many are struggling in, in different ways. And we pray that across this city and land, your people will be equipped and willing to respond to the needs and to the challenges and to the opportunities that are there. Forgive us, Lord, for times when we are spectators rather than participants in what is going on and indeed in what you are doing. And guide us in the work locally, Father, that we might seek ways and, and find ways of more effectively sharing you with the people around us, of sharing Jesus, because, Lord, our great desire is that others might come to know him too. And, Lord, as we pray, we think of those known to us who have particular needs, those who are on our hearts, and in the quiet, we bring them to you. Lord, be near to each one. May they know your comfort, your strength, your guidance, your peace your love, your hope. In Jesus' name, amen. So let's close our service as we sing together, My Heart is Filled with Thankfulness. is filled with thankfulness. 
peace and may the blessing of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit rest upon us today and always. Amen.